Trying to pick a date to start the history of the modern Middle East is not particularly easy. You could begin the timeline at the end of World War I and the dawn of the new borders, or you could go all the way back to the Siege of Vienna when the Ottomans entered their period of stagnation. However, I believe the end of the 18th century is probably the best starting point, as this was a pivotal time for nearly every country. In Arabia, the Wahhabis and the Saudis signed a pact and began to spread their new ideology. In Egypt, Napoleon invaded and Muhammad Ali came to power and his dynasty tried to create an empire of their own. In Persia, numerous dynasties collapsed until finally the Qajar dynasty rose. And in India, the Mughal Empire was reduced to a rum state, in Afghanistan the Durrani Empire rose, in short it was a crucial period in the Islamic world. Yet it's worth doing a quick scan over the other powers in the 1700s, starting with the major Islamic powers, the Ottomans, Persia and the Mughals. These, the gunpowder empires, were once dominant, but by the 18th century they were on the decline. Now many point to roughly the same causes for the fall of these empires, like the lack of development, particularly as opposed to the Europeans. Or some blame European colonialism, whether it be the Russians in the Caucasus or Britain in India. Others blame that they became decadent, like the Ottoman slave soldiers, the Janissaries, who gave up on their military ways and adopted a more peaceful bureaucratic life with their families. However, once you start picking at any of these threads, you'll find out that the story is not so simple. Going a little bit further back to the 1600s, this period was pretty disastrous for both the Europeans and the Ottomans. Historians call this period in Europe the General Crisis, as it was filled with religious wars, plague pandemics and environmental problems like the Little Ice Age. But this was also true for many of the Islamic empires. The Ottomans in the 1620s had a plague epidemic and the Great Winter of 1621. This was in fact so bad that the Bosphorus froze and it caused a famine. Yet through it all the empires did adapt, and in the case of the Ottomans, survived for another 200 years. For instance, late in the century they modernized their navy to such an extent that even English diplomats were impressed and sought to emulate them. While on the other side of Asia, the Mughals were incredibly well armed, even with rocket artillery. So they were developing. But there were some aspects of the modern world that some empires rejected for a while. For instance, the printing press. In the Ottoman Empire, Jews, Armenians and other groups used it, but the Muslims refused to do so until the early 1700s. There are some reasons behind this, like the authority of the Islamic scholars, who would have seen their power as the gatekeepers of knowledge diminish. So in France at the end of the 18th century, 47% of men were literate, 68% of British men were, and 80% of Prussian men were. Well, they were literate to a degree that they could sign their name. The Ottoman Empire and the other gunpowder empires on the other hand probably only had a literate population of 2-3%. Yet when compared with the rivals of the Ottoman Empire, the numbers balance out a bit more. Russia for instance probably only had 6% of literate men, and Spain not much higher at around 10%. But first, you may have realised that most of these multicultural empires were filled with a number of languages, if only they had Speakly, who I'd like to thank for sponsoring this video. Speakly can teach you how to speak a number of languages like Spanish, Russian, Italian and French, but you won't just be repeating phrases that you'll never use. This is because Speakly was created by two polyglots who speak seven languages. So they know what it takes to learn a foreign language and have catered the courses to get you speaking the basics, the useful basics, in no time. In fact, based on research, Speakly's methods will help you learn five times faster compared to what you are used to. So, with only around 30 minutes practice a day, you can go from a beginner to having solid speaking skills in around three to four months. Speakly offers everything you need to learn a language, like studying new vocabulary, speaking and writing exercises, and even music recommendations in the language that you're learning. And you can learn all of this pretty much anywhere, as it's available on web and mobile, both Android and iOS. So click the link below, improve your work prospects, or get ready for that new trip, and start learning a new language today. Plus, you can also just give Speakly a try, thanks to their 7 day free trial. And if you continue, you'll get a 60% discount on their annual subscription. Again, thanks to Speakly for sponsoring this video, but now let's get back to the Islamic empires. The other often cited cause of their demise is weak leadership and lavish lifestyles of their rulers, 
especially after Suleiman the Magnificent. Most sultans were kept inside the palace their entire lives, and were largely ill-equipped to govern the state. The reason behind this was because Suleiman's own sons, the ones that had learned how to fight and govern, actually betrayed him. So the next sultan was Selim II, who was known as Selim the Drunkard. Plus beforehand the sultans would often kill their own siblings to stop any rebellions, but from the late 16th century, they would largely just leave them to live in luxury in the palaces as well. With the sultan's authority diminishing, power was slowly divided up between other institutions. This division of power however doesn't necessarily spell disaster. After all, the British king shared power with parliament, and Japanese emperors surrendered power to the shoguns. And much of Europe was filled with lavish courts, like in France. And although the king may have lost his head, the country not only survived, but continued to expand. However, factionalism within the Ottoman court was commonplace. Sometimes the slave Janissary soldiers took a great deal of power, bribing or threatening their way into administrative posts. Or for around a century from the middle of the 1500s, the wives or mothers of sultans held a great deal of power, hence this period was called the Sultanate of the Women. What's interesting here though is the vast majority of these women were actually foreigners. They could be Russian, Venetian, Greek, Circassian, or practically from anywhere except Turkey. Also within the court, eunuchs could very often be the kingmakers. These eunuchs were divided between white eunuchs, usually from the Balkans, and black eunuchs from Africa. Some of these played a vital role during the Sultanate of the Women, and helped remove some influential women from power. While in the 18th century, Bashir Aga would have the power to depose viziers. More often than not though, it was these grand viziers that would usually fill the void and act like a sultan. For instance, Mehmet Koprulu ruled in the 17th century. He rooted out corruption, and even tried to make the Ottoman Empire an expansionist nation once again. His brother-in-law would rule after him, and he would send troops to Vienna, believing the Reformation had weakened Europe. However, by now, European countries had been catching up with the Islamic world. Plus, beforehand, the Ottomans were able to exploit the differences between European nations, allowing the Bulgarians and Serbians to fight one another before moving in. But now, the Europeans were more inclined to aid one another. So this unity of European nations could very much have started the period of stagnation. And I should also say that Europeans may have brought about the demise of the Islamic empires by sailing around Africa. This meant that the trade that once flowed from China through Persia into the Ottoman Empire now completely bypassed them. This is an often cited cause, but really it affected some more than others. The Central Asian Khanates completely declined, and Persia adapted to this change incredibly slowly. But for the Ottomans, their budget actually grew during this period, from 1 million Akja in 1699 to 1 1.5 million 50 years later. Plus, the increase in trade in the region actually provided new market for things like coffee, which Ottoman Yemen had a monopoly over. They also still produced a great deal like textiles and leather goods that were sold in Europe. However, to raise further revenues, the Ottomans introduced Malikane. This was a form of tax farming, which I'll get onto later. However, I believe this is one of the chief causes behind their decline. But, now in Europe, the Ottomans faced a somewhat united Catholic force, of Polish, Austrians, Venetians, and more. To make matters even worse, Russia under Peter the Great would also become a modern expansionist power. Before him, the Russians built forts out of wood, and until quite recently, the Ottomans' vassals in Crimea were raiding Moscow for slaves. But now the Russians too were using gunpowder. This again is seemingly the greatest cause of Ottoman stagnation. Before they faced weak disjointed armies, but now they faced equal powers on all sides. So in the end the Ottomans would lose in Vienna, and the United Europeans would drive them out of Hungary in 1699, and huge chunks of the Balkans later on. However, that's not to say the Ottomans were now forever on the retreat. For instance, they retook Moria from the Venetians, demonstrating they were capable of fighting modern wars, just maybe not on all fronts. Their loss of Hungary though also seems to have encouraged them to make some reforms in the 18th century. They finally began printing their own books, they opened up a technical university in the capital, and an artillery school modelled on the western style. But still, they had to fight the Russians in the north, Persians in the east, the Austrians in the Balkans, and the Venetians at sea. To give some examples of these wars, they'd fight the Russians in 1710, 1735, 1768, and 1787. 
and they'd also fight Persia in 1730, 1743, and 1775. And this is just in the 18th century alone. Yet, strangely, possibly one of the worst things to affect the Ottoman army at this time was a period of peace on the Western Front, from 1740 to 1768. This was a period of peace for the Ottomans, but was a time of conflict for the Europeans as they fought the Seven Years' War. This war brought about huge changes in tactics on the battlefield, and in many cases, a complete societal change. The French would later cut off the head of their king, and introduce mobilization to fight off all invading European armies. The Americans would declare their independence, forming a republic. The British Prussians and many other nations would begin to feel a sense of nationalism, a unity of character represented by symbols and the likes. The Ottomans, on the other hand, continued on much as they did before. There was no great need to completely restructure their army, and the wave of nationalism which would come to the empire later on would eventually prove to be disastrous. Yet still, I don't believe this is their chief problem. And this brings me possibly to their greatest issue, and this would be true for all of the gunpowder empires. Their nations were just incredibly divided. After such rapid conquests, they left a lot of the existing powers in place. So, authority in regions were split between various groups who often acted autonomously, and power in the capital was only possible by balancing a complicated web of these alliances together. The Ottomans would have to deal with pirates in Algeria, Mamluks in Egypt, Kurdish states in Iraq, the Druze in Lebanon, and a whole host of other leaders. These leaders were also usually foreign, often fought against one another, and constantly struggled for more power against the government in Constantinople. Whether that was through outright independence wars, removing Ottoman governors from their territory, taking over the taxes, or fighting with their neighbours. However, as we look at the history of the region, you will see how complicated this gets. On top of all that, in the early 18th century, Mustafa II sent his soldiers to Georgia, hoping to install a puppet on the throne. His janissaries, however, had not been paid, and they revolted in 1703. This, the Dern incident, saw the Sultan replaced by his brother, Ahmed III, and it demonstrated to all future Sultans that challenging the power of the janissaries could be a very dangerous game. Ahmed III is probably best known for the Tulip period, a period of relative peace in which there was actually a bit of a Tulip craze. Internationally, he got involved in some conflicts, losing further land to the Austrians and fighting with the Russians. This war began because he gave the King of Sweden sanctuary and was part of the much larger Great Northern War. But their campaign against the Russians, the Pruth River Campaign, was actually successful, proving they were not completely out of the military race yet. But soon the Persians would invade, and he would be removed by the Janissaries. This time though, it was an Albanian named Petrona Halil that led thousands in revolt, and forced Ahmed to surrender his throne over to Mahmud I. He cracked down on the rebels and secured power until the middle of the 1750s. During his reign, he lost some influence around Ukraine to the Russians, but was able to recapture some land, like Belgrade from the Austrians. But this marked the beginning of peace on the Western Front that was to be so disastrous, as he had to deal with a resurgent Persia who invaded the East. Mustafa III, who came after him, also lost further land to the Russians in 1774, including their vassal state, the Crimean Khanate. But attempts were made to reform the army, as French and Prussian advisers were brought into the country to help them. But their loss against the Russians, at least this time, could probably be placed more down to internal divisions which I'll get onto later, as the rulers of Egypt and Palestine broke free, and began wars within their own borders. The next war with the Russians and Austrians began in 1787 under Abdul Hamid I. This again was hampered by internal issues, as Orthodox Albanians and their Muslim allies began the Soliot War. But by this point, it was beginning to become obvious that the Ottomans were falling behind the other armies. Like at the Battle of Rimnik, 100,000 Ottomans lost to 25,000 men of the combined Russian-Austrian army. Now, some of the changes made to the Russian army beforehand may not sound remarkable, but they seem to have made the difference in this war. Improvement in bayonet training, espionage, supply convoys, and the promotion of generals with new ideas, notably Suvorov, all completely transformed the battlefield. Russian successes were so complete that Suvorov was actually marching on Constantinople, 
and Catherine the Great had plans on restoring the Byzantine Empire. Thankfully for the Ottomans at least, they were saved thanks to the French Revolution, as European eyes turned towards France instead. The Ottomans were therefore beginning to lag behind, and I'd say changes in just something as simple as infrastructure would prove to be nearly impossible. Bedouin tribesmen still raided travellers, and sometimes even major cities like Aleppo. Governors in the Levant were in a near constant war with one another, and again nearly half of their empire were in open rebellion, or at least acting independently. Guaranteeing safe travel was hard enough, so imagine the complexity of transporting troops and their supplies to fight the Persians or Russians at the other side of their empire. Even raising an army would be hard enough. In France they could mobilise hundreds of thousands, all fighting largely under the same banner. Well, the Ottomans would request troops from often rebellious governors, Sometimes these soldiers would come with whatever weapons they had, and sometimes they wouldn't come at all. Much of their army was made up of irregular troops that were poorly trained. Some of these units were based on ethnicities, like Kurdish cavalry units, that spent most of their time collecting taxes and brutalising other enemy tribes within the empire, rather than fighting in foreign wars. And, of course, you had the Janissaries, who could turn against the Sultan at any time. The Ottomans therefore lost a great deal of land in the 18th century, but still this web of internal alliances would probably be more disastrous. This is even more obvious in the Safavid dynasty, the first of these empires to fall. The Safavids were foreigners, Turkic foreigners, and had even forced the population to convert to Shia Islam. The fact that they were foreigners wasn't particularly rare in Persian history, as the Akkoyunlu, who ruled beforehand, were also Turkmen rulers. The Safavids also held on to power through the help of Shia Turkic warriors known as the Kizil Bash, but they too could be divided into various tribes. So a more stable solution for the army was needed. Shah Abbas tried to create a new army, loyal to neither the Turkic people or the Persians, a new unit of soldiers from the Caucasus. These troops from Georgia, Armenia and Circassia would be very prevalent across the Middle East, forming the bulk of the Ottoman Janissaries as well, and even the Mamluks. Plus it should be said that some soldiers came from further afield, like there seems to have been a small number of Africans in their army. With the help of this new force, the Kizilbash, and the help of some English advisors, the Safavids were able to expand into Uzbek lands and across the Persian Gulf, bringing Shia Islam into the region. But the Safavids were still a tribe, a tribe that needed the support of other ethnic groups to maintain power. Many times that was tested, like in the early 1600s, the Kurds rebelled. Then the Georgians rebelled a couple times when the Shah tried to repopulate their lands with the Kizilbash. The country was also being raided on all fronts by Dagestanis, the Baluch, and many more. And at the same time, they were fighting against the Mughals, the Ottomans, the Russians, and many other nations. Plus, at the same time, they were also saddled with weak rulers. After the rule of great rulers like Ishmael and Abbas, came the likes of Suleiman I who spent most of his time in his harem and drinking. Nevertheless, many of the Persian, or at least the Turkic nobility, were pretty happy with this setup. Whereas the British had a parliament to continue running the country if they had a mad king like George III, or the Ottomans had their Grand Vizier, the Persians didn't really have anything like that. Plus, in the past, the rulers constantly moved about their capital, keeping a small but mobile court, and appeasing the outer regions. However, now the Shahs were static, trapped in their capital, more specifically the palace, meaning the nobles were essentially free to conduct their own business. Some shahs did try to assert some authority, like Sultan Hussein. He was extremely religious and began to follow the instructions of the imams, so he introduced a number of pretty extreme laws. Zoroastrians were forced to convert, and even non-Shia people were forbidden from going outside in the rain, just in case they polluted the Shia. By this point though we had entered the 1700s, and the Islamic revival was ongoing. From India to Saudi Arabia, many Salafist thinkers were looking to make Islamic law stricter. The Wahhabis in Arabia, the Deobandi in India, and the Shia scholars of Persia all began to preach a more rigid version of Islam. Now many claim this was in response to Christian Europe, but I feel this is sometimes a little bit too simplistic. This may be true in India, but the Arabian tribes had no real contact with the Europeans beforehand. So I generally tend to find that many place Europeans as the cause of many movements, but really it probably came from within. 
Think of this Islamic revival in comparison to the Puritans of Europe. The printing press had been introduced to many areas, finally spreading ideas across the Islamic world. And, just like in Europe, many people began to reject folk traditions, superstitions and the likes. While as for the Persians becoming more aggressively anti-Sunni, this could be because they were just at war with Sunni nations as well. Again, this is very similar to what happened in Europe just a couple of decades earlier. However, their anti-Sunni policies were far from popular, especially among the Sunni Afghans. They united under Mirwaiya's Hotak and rebelled, rather than convert. Central to their rebellion was strangely the Georgian king of Kartli, George XI. He had sworn allegiance to the Pope back when the Ottomans failed in Vienna, hoping to exploit the situation. Then he even tried to align with the Ottomans against his Persian rulers. He was then arrested and the situation in his native Georgia was growing worse. So, peace was made. He agreed to convert and then was sent to Afghanistan to subdue the Afghans, but was promptly killed. So, here we see a Turkic dynasty sending a Georgian convert to subdue Sunni Afghans on behalf of Persia. You can see how this web is often a complicated mess. But the Afghans continued to win early battles, and then took the capital of Isfahan in 1722. Yet, how this band of Afghan rebels, completely outnumbered, were able to achieve such victories is open for debate. In the Battle of Gulnabad, the Afghans hooked around the Persian lines and struck at their cannons. A couple thousand Persians were killed, but still they retreated, despite outnumbering the Afghans two to one. What gave them such low morale is hard to explain. Plus, the fact they sent in their cannons without escort, despite receiving European training, also just seems like poor leadership. Otherwise, many nobles and their Georgian vassals just refused to help out. So, the Safavid rulers fled, and now Afghans ruled in the capital city. During this chaos, the Russians and Ottomans took over some land from the Persians, and the new Afghan Hotak dynasty didn't last for long. In the north, Tarmasp II, a deposed Safavid ruler, tried to find support to reclaim the throne. The Qajar tribe rallied behind him, and so too did Nadia Shah. Nadia was himself a Kizilbash, but he grew up very poor. In fact, in some stories it says that he, along with his mother, were enslaved by the Uzbeks. Yet he returned to Persia, and in the army he flourished. So when the Afghans invaded, he gained some degree of power in the northeast. He led the loyalists into battle to reclaim land on behalf of the Safavids. But over time it became clear that Tarmas would not be the greatest ruler. He in fact launched a disastrous campaign to reclaim the Caucasus from the Ottomans. So Nadia Shah deposed him in favour of his young son, and continued to launch more successful campaigns, reclaiming land from the Ottomans and Russia, and finally chasing the Afghans out of the capital and back to their base. In 1736 he was powerful enough to oust and murder the remaining Safavid rulers and take power himself. But he was from a completely different tribe, the Afshar. They were again Turkmen, so again not Persian. And originally they were from Central Asia but moved to Azerbaijan before some of them moved over to Eastern Persia. Plus most of his army were not Persian either. In 1743 he had around 375,000 soldiers. 70,000 were Afghan, 60,000 were Turkmen, and 60,000 were from Azerbaijan. Add in various other groups like the Kurdish, and you had a very diverse army, most of which were not local. This army was also remarkably well equipped, at least compared to his predecessors. The Safavids did have a corps of musketeers and artillerymen back in the 16th century, but over time the bulk of their army consisted of semi-nomadic tribal warriors. These were equipped with again whatever they brought to the field, including lances and bows. They still made up a huge chunk of Nadia Shah's forces, but they were slowly being equipped with modern 18th century firearms. And they were also drilled in the European way. This huge force however would prove to be too costly in the long run, and without loot, the country would have been quickly bankrupt. Nevertheless, all of this helped him actually turn the tide on the Ottomans as he invaded Mesopotamia. He also reasserted Persian control over in places like Bahrain and Oman. His greatest accomplishment though probably came in 1739, when he led an army into the weakening Mughal Empire and sacked Delhi. Even though Sikhs raided his caravans on return trips, he was still able to steal so much wealth from the Mughals that he stopped taxation for three years. 
Nadia Shah was now somewhat poised to become a great conqueror, emulating his heroes like Genghis Khan and Tamerlane. In fact, he even copied Tamerlane by building towers out of the skulls of his enemies and rebels. Plus, to help in this pursuit, he even tried to bridge the gap between Sunnis and Shias. To do this, he created a new school of Sunni thought, known as the Jafari school. This, after all, would gain support among many of the Sunnis in his empire, like the Kurds, Pashtuns, Turkmens and more. And he would also gain more legitimacy abroad, in countries that he wanted to expand into. However, his cruelty worried many of his nobles, who betrayed him in 1747 and murdered him in his tent. Adil Shah, his son, succeeded him, and he had many of his relatives killed. But other relatives fought for the throne, and as they did, the country once again fell into anarchy, as various ethnic groups, tribes and the likes fought for power. A pretty small tribe known as the Zand exploited the situation best. They are a tribe of Lax, which in turn could be a branch of the Kurds, or, as they argue, a branch of the Lur people. As you can see, many of these tribal histories are often conflicting. They originally lived in modern-day Iraq, but successive governments constantly moved tribes from region to region, whether that's the Zand further east, or the Turk at Kizilbash to Georgia, or even the Georgians out to modern-day Iraq. Population transfers seemingly occurred pretty regularly. Well, the Zand under Karim Khan Zand did follow Nadia Shah until his assassination, but they quickly began to challenge his successors. First though, they moved back to their tribal homeland in the west and settled some tribal conflicts, fighting against the Bakhtiari. This initially resulted in disaster, and the Bakhtiari leader Ali Mardin Khan seized the city of Golpa Yagan. Ali Mardin and the Bakhtiari tribe then tried to seize the city of Isfahan. Strangely enough though, Karim Khan and the Zand decided to put aside their differences and join him. They actually planned on bringing back the Safavid dynasty, at least in name, and brought a deposed young prince along with them to make the puppet ruler. So the citizens of Isfahan surrendered in 1750. Ali Mardan of the Bakhtiari and Karim Khan of the Zand were now sharing power in the capital city. But Karim soon departed to launch an expedition in Kurdistan. While he was away, Ali Mardan tried to assert his control over the capital, but Karim soon returned and the two met in battle. This following war, as you'd expect, was a complicated mess. Ali Mardan would flee to Ottoman Baghdad. There he would gain the support of an Afsharid diplomat and even a Safavid prince. Plus, he even got support from a Pashtun ruler, Azad Khan Afghan. There were plans for the two sides to divide the country to make peace and allow a Safavid prince to rule. But peace never lasted. In the end, Ali Mardan would be killed, and Karim would become the new ruler of Persia. However, it was a broken country. Take for instance the Pashtun ruler, Azad Khan Afghan. You may think he held power near Afghanistan, but no, he held power around Azerbaijan. Nearby him were a number of Kurdish states. Now, some of their history goes back centuries, and they were largely allowed to keep their autonomy under Persian rule. Others, however, popped up very recently. Over in the east of the country, strangely, many Arabs who had settled there took power in places like Mishmasht. Turkmen tribal confederations took the north, plus for a little while, Nadia Shah's son, Sharuk, ruled in Khorasan. And in between all those states were a host of other, even smaller states. Another tribe of Turkmen came to prominence as well, the Qajar. Under Muhammad Hassan, they tried to take Mashhad from the successor of Nadia Shah, Adal Shah. He was later captured again and sent as a prisoner to live with Karim Khan. While he was in prison, his tribe continued gaining ground in the north of the country, and they would later exploit future civil wars. Possibly the greatest empire to emerge from all of this division, though, was the Durrani Empire, created in Afghanistan. The Hotak dynasty beforehand was formed by members of the Giliji Pashtun tribe, but they had already been defeated by Nadia Shah. So now the Abdali, or Durrani tribe of Pashtuns, would form their own empire. They had originally rebelled against Nadia Shah, but soon they were quite loyal allies of his. Nadia Shah had actually expelled many of the Gilijis from their territories east of Kandahar, and settled Persians, Kizilbash, and the Durranis there. In return, Ahmad Shah Durrani served in Nadia Shah's armies, and he was apparently one of his best soldiers in the capture of Delhi. When Nadia Shah was killed, 
the leaders of the Durrani were outraged. They rushed to Nadia's tent to confirm the news and found his dead body. But when leaving, they did take with them the Koh-i-Noor diamond, which Nadia Shah had stolen from the Mughals. The outraged leaders also decided to appoint Ahmed Shah as their new leader of the Durrani Empire. His ethnically diverse armies quickly captured nearby lands, like Herat in 1750, Balkh and Badakhshan the following year, and Kashmir the year after. In 1754, he also invaded Khorasan, taking the lands from the weakening rule of the final Afsharid ruler. Meanwhile, over in the capital, Karim Khan Zand had been busy consolidating power himself, but he died in 1779, and, as is usually the case, none of his successors were able to continue to rule effectively. Muhammad Hassan, the eunuch member of the Qajar tribe, managed to escape his imprisonment and return to the north. There he led the Turkic tribesmen in battle, conquering much of the north and even the kingdoms of Georgia, re-establishing Persian control in the Caucasus. The Russians had actually taken advantage of the chaos in Persia by expanding into the Caucasus, promising to aid the Georgian Christians in times of war. Their king, Heracles II, had actually served with Nadia Shah, but now the united Georgian kingdoms were happy to accept Russian protection. However, it didn't help much. Aga Muhammad Hassan was a remarkably violent leader, even when compared to many of his contemporaries. He completely devastated Tbilisi. Reports indicate the city was reduced to ashes, the roads were filled with corpses, and many of the dead were piled high into towers. Catherine the Great did send an army to retake the country in 1796, but she died and her successor, Paul I, called the soldiers back. Aga Muhammad continued to plunder and torch his way around the country, like he marched on Khorasan, captured Sharuk, and tortured him to death. The final Zand ruler, Lotf Ali Khan, was then betrayed by the ruler of Bam. He was handed over to the Qajar and again tortured to death. So Aga Muhammad was able to finally be crowned Shah in 1796. However, just one year later, he launched an invasion of Karabakh in the Caucasus. There, he was assassinated by a servant who he had actually ordered to be killed. But when the execution was delayed, the servant decided to kill the Shah. His successor though, Fat Ali Shah, was actually able to succeed to the throne somewhat peacefully. There was a small rebellion led by Nadia Mirza, the great-grandson of Nadia Shah and ruler of Khorasan. However, this was crushed, he was blinded, he had his tongue cut off and ultimately was executed. So the empire was finally stable, but really this was the limits of it. To the east they helped the emir of Kalat break free from Durrani, but the Persians never exerted influence over the state themselves. While to the north, the Russians began to take their land away from them. After decades of war, the state had essentially fell far behind. Around half of their population was nomadic, they barely cultivated the land, bandits roamed around the few roads that actually did exist, and the nobility were essentially ruling independent nations. Taxes were barely paid to the central government, leaving them pretty much bankrupt and unable to introduce any new reforms. So they weren't able to modernize their army, before the Russians launched a series of wars against them in the 19th century. But you may have noticed that during the 18th century, the Persians and Afghans had invaded the Mughal Empire many times. And although I won't be focusing too much on the Indian subcontinent, I should mention a little bit about the final gunpowder empire. In the late 1600s, they were ruled by Aurangzeb. He is possibly one of the most complicated characters in history, and his legacy is still hotly debated today. He inherited an empire which again was created by Islamic Turkic rulers over a century earlier. Initially, they were ruled by tolerant rulers like Akbar, and this was particularly important in an empire mainly consisting of Hindus. But Aurangzeb was far less tolerant. He introduced the jizya, a tax on non-Muslims, and crushed rebellions brutally. In particular, in the north, the relatively new Sikh religion was targeted with particular ferocity. For instance, he executed the sixth Guru Teg Bahadur for refusing to convert, and this resulted in the militarization of the Sikh community. You can see this militarization of their community by the way many Sikhs still dress today, as they carry weapons to protect themselves against further persecution. Later on, the ninth Guru was also executed, while his companions were boiled alive, burned, and sawn into pieces. Bounties were also placed on the heads of Sikhs. So groups of Mughals would go headhunting 
chasing them further into the mountains and forests. Again, the Mughals also largely relied on a series of alliances with different tribes, lords and ethnicities to maintain power. And, as always, this was a delicate balance, disrupted under Aurangzeb's rule. Most notably, in the south, the Hindu Maratha rebelled against them, starting an incredibly long war. On the other hand, though, Aurangzeb had expanded the empire and turned it into the richest country in the world. But to accomplish his final conquest of the Deccan Sultanates, it would take him over 20 years and untold wealth. These Deccan Sultanates were, as the name suggests, Islamic. But, once again, a complicated mix of ethnicities. Many were Turkic, or, like the rulers of Bijapur, they were descendants from, once again, Georgian slaves. In Ahmadnagar, they had a number of African slaves as well. Some, like Malik Ambar, would even rise to the position of Prime Minister. And his daughter even went on to marry a Circassian warrior, and he would join the Mughal army. The languages spoken could be Urdu or Persian, or sometimes even local Marathi. And often the various factions within court fought one another for control. But although Aurangzeb temporarily managed to conquer these territories, when he died in the early 1700s, his successors couldn't keep control of such a vast empire. During the following succession crises, a couple of brothers, the Sayyids, rose to prominence. They almost acted as kingmakers for a while, but their origins are somewhat odd for the empire. They were from a tribe known as the Sadat Ibarra, who claimed descent from Ali. They were therefore Shia, but famously were some of the most ferocious warriors in the Sunni Mughal armies. In their pursuit to maintain power though, they constantly removed, killed or imprisoned emperors. Like in 1719, there were four emperors. Muhammad Shah was able to finally remove them, but he could not recover the power of the Mughal Empire. During his rule, the Maratha took over most of the Deccan, while a collection of other states declared their independence. It was also at this time that Nadia Shah sacked Delhi and plundered its wealth. And of course, later on, the Afghan Durranis would invade as well. For a while in the late 18th century, there was a constant back and forth between these empires. For instance, the Durrani invaded Delhi, the Maratha drove the Durrani out of Delhi, and in return for aiding them, the Mughal Empire actually became a vassal of the Maratha. Plus, during this time, the Sikhs began to take over land for themselves, and many of the newly independent states began to fall under British influence. The new state of Carnatic fell under British influence after a succession crisis and three Carnatic Wars. These wars involved the French and their Indian allies against the British and their Indian allies. Then Bengal fell to the British in the 1750s. But to give you some idea of how chaotic this period was and how ruinous the wars were, this state of Bengal had been invaded by the Maratha six times in just 10 years before the British even got there. The war with the British began when the ruler of Bengal threw British traders into a dungeon known as the Black Hole of Calcutta. The East India Company should have had no chance in the following wars. After all, they only had a few hundred soldiers and a couple thousand Indian allies. But there was a conspiracy at court. Mir Jafar, the commander of Bengal's armies, defected, bringing with him around 45,000 men at the Battle of Plassey. In return, he was made ruler of Bengal temporarily, but he would be removed by the British later on, and this province would now be the base of British expansion. So, just like in Carnatic, the British didn't necessarily conquer outright, but rather they supported a local leader. In the case of Carnatic, it was Walaja, who aided the British in their wars against the French in Mysore. With their Indian allies, the East India Company continued to expand into Maratha, Mysore and Mughal territory. So by the early 1800s, after winning the Second Maratha War, the Mughal Empire was made a protectorate of the East India Company. So, the Mughals had disappeared as a force by this point, although their emperor did still sit on a throne in Delhi. The Persians had seen a number of dynasties, civil wars and a breakdown of order, and the Ottomans are losing land in Europe in particular. 